watched the ones before and I found out about Aero. Okay. And looked at the system and stuff. I was quite impressed in a way. Aero was like the fact that you were so organized has spurred me to think, you know what, we should have something which is organized to teach. Oh, we inspired you. Yeah, you inspired. <laughs> I take good. inspiration from everywhere, you know. So That's I thought I'd let you know about that. There's no reason not to. Oh, thank you, bro. Uh, so I think you guys, you know, with your sort of uh, the, the literature and the fact that it's all free, that was good. Now I enjoyed it. So. So what do you guys do? By the way, I know nothing about Sikhism, not much. Okay. So if you were to come to someone like me, what would be the first few things for you to say to someone like me? Well, in a way, the first thing you would teach someone is that there's one, for us, there's one creator, um, and all the human race is equal, and that every human being connected to God. And the gurus, they were sent by that creator uh, to be a guide, but also um, that they, their message it's not just about the morals, but the fact that inside each of us, there's a war between us and God, of ego. And the, and the Guru, he allows us to surrender to him, which makes us, being able, uh, through the Guru, to experience the Divine. Through his teachings? Yeah, through his teachings and through his actual the surrender to the Guru. Whether you call it the teachings or the personality, but inside you have that love for someone. Yeah? Uh, and the Guru uh, he allows us to, to do that. So, um, yeah, that's what we're teaching that Sikhism is pretty much uh, a group of people that are following the ten Gurus and their teachings. We, we can't take uh, the, the Guru out of Sikhism. It's, Sikhism is all about the Guru. Why, why is that? Because the, the Guru is the person that came with that truth. The Guru is the one that can do grace. So compared to, say, a philosophy... Intrinsically or is it by, by the divine? Yeah, by the divine. Okay. Uh, but he has the power to do grace. He's been given that authority by God. Okay. So how do you know? How I want to ask that question. How do you know he's a guru? He's special, and he's right. been given grace, or he has the ability to give grace. Well, when he does grace upon you, and you realize, oh, that grace comes from the guru. So it's experiential. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We're not trying to prove our religion through any arguments or anything else. Like that. Oh, it's we, really experiential. We just say, look, look at the guru's lives. You know, um, most Sikhs grow up learning about the guru's lives. They grow up learning about um, what the guru's are teaching, and that then allows them to say, oh wow, the gurus are great. You know, once they start getting the idea the gurus are great, then where did they get this from? Where did their teachings come from? Where did they get this inspiration? Where did they get the strength from? You know, yeah, yeah, what, what yeah. are they teaching? So when you start putting their teachings into practice, and then you appreciate like, wow, the gurus are not only amazing, but the teachings work. Absolutely. The only problem I, ha I may have with that, just intuitively, is that if you already know what greatness is, then you don't need the guru. Because if you're judging a guru by a standard of greatness, mm. and you already know what that greatness is, yeah. then you don't need the guru as a source of greatness anymore. Well, I would say. I want to know how is the guru as well in Sikhism in general a foundation for morality, a foundation for your purpose of life? Because if you already have a standard and you're applying that standard to your standard, then there's yeah. a problem. Can you see that? If only if you assume that all of us are complete idiots. That we can't work out even a simple percentage of what is true or not. I think that the God's given God's light is inside all of us, and that all of us have a certain potential to understand. Uh, even, a, even a scale of zero to a hundred, I'd say that most of us, human beings across the world, every religion, can uh, come to some agreement about decent moral human values. Right? So, so that percentage is say maybe 50 percent, 60 percent, or whatever, 70 billion. And then there's a percentage that we're not aware of, where we need a guide to take us to the next level. So I would say that in terms of morality, you know, Sikhs have no problem in understanding what the Guru uh, gives us that extra, the, what, what is the full truth. So, uh, when you look at the Guru, you think, oh, he acted compassionately, and your heart melts. That's part of God within you, because we're made of compassion. Uh, for us, uh, we believe that the five qualities that are very important for us to have are truth, uh, contentment, compassion, justice, and forgiveness. So when we see that in our Gurus, our heart intrinsically tears up. When people are watching a video on YouTube and they see something amazing and now the tears coming up, that's just because their soul, their soul is reacting to the goodness of absolutely, that person. Absolutely. They don't need someone to come and tell them, this is good. We have an internet as goodness. So with the Gurus, when we see them, the wow comes from, we just look at them and go wow. Absolutely. But then, the Gurus teach us further what more is left from beyond just what we figured out through our natural human you know, divine. So that's eight percent. You'd have to trust a guru, basically. Yeah, and you and you build that trust based upon their life and how they lived and what they did and what they said. But also, like I said earlier, it's not just about what they said and what they did, but how that when you put that into practice, how it affects you. For example, you're like you, let's say you like going to the gym. Just by the so now you may have a trainer at the gym, or if you don't have a trainer, you might have read books. 
Yeah. Or you might have met people that are trained, they might have guided you at the beginning and now you're okay by yourself. But now you might be training somebody else. And the only reason they look at you and say, oh, take his advice is because they think, oh, you know, he must have worked on it for a little while, he must know something about yeah, it. Yeah. Right? So in the same way, the gurus are like that, but then when that person puts your philosophy into practice, or when you put somebody else's philosophy into practice, and it works for you, then you know, oh, you know, this way is real, it's worked. You know, so it's based upon experience, but it's also based upon trust. And so according to that, does the Sikh tradition believe that like, other traditions are pathway to salvation as well? We believe that there's truth in, 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 in many, many things. Like for example, say I happen to be a Buddhist, right? And I adopt Buddhism one day, hypothetically. And Buddhism works for me. I trust the Buddha, right? 70% is intuitive, 30% I trust in Buddha's life and his teachings. Then would that be a part of salvation according to the Sikh tradition? Well, Are you perennialist? When you were saying 70% to 100%, for us the 100% truth is only from the Guru. I see. But uh, and so you're not perennialist, basically. What's that? Basically, all rivers lead to the same sea. Yeah, we do believe in that as well. But what I'm going to explain to you is that a person, an individual. By the way, I'm not trying to challenge you. I'm yeah. going to find out what you actually yeah. believe in. Right? A, a normal human person doesn't need the hundred percent the truth to get salvation. Okay. Yeah. The standard that God requires from a normal human being is not that high. So say, say I don't so a normal person yeah. just needs to meditate upon God's name be a good human and try their best because we're all imperfect we're all flawed individuals in some, in some way yeah? so the standard is not that high so, the, so you, you don't have to know all the truth to get salvation same way when you look at a Buddhist it doesn't mean that every Buddhist is the same yeah, every Buddhist has got a different philosophy so when you look at a Buddhist you look at that one person individually what does that person think what do they say what do they do so everybody gets judged on these three things so we believe that everybody has a book right and that book consists of what we said what we thought and what we did. Yes. Yeah, man, bach, karam, bach, 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 bach. And these three things, they determine the judgment is. Yeah? And everybody gets judged. And it's continuous judgment. So the minute you die, you get judged. You never wait around for a judgment day. You get judged straight away. And then based upon that, you might come back into reincarnation. You might come back into um, the uh, uh, animal life or a human life. Yep. Or a better uh, a human life. You might get a more spiritual family. Or you might get salvation. Final question, which I think is important for me. Because the way I became Muslim is due to this question, right? So what I would say then is, so there's an element of trusting the Guru because of his teachings. We have this intuitive, natural standard that we apply to things. This is great, this is nice, this is moral. And we have the 30% of applying these teachings and living out these teachings. No, 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 I didn't say 30%. I just said that was just like a standard, that was the name. But our heart intrinsically appeals to 50% or 70%. Oh, I see what you're saying. And then there's that element where we have oh, to trust. Learn. We have to learn. We can learn. So okay. You talk about the standard of 100% okay, truth. Okay, brilliant. You said, where does it come from? Yeah. I said, like, you might get a lot of that from yourself. Yep. The rest of the standard comes from the Guru. But that you take that standard because based on the, on the, on the, on the trust of the Guru. The trust of the Guru. So I wasn't saying that the Guru then does the next 30% for you. Absolutely. It's just that he might not, he that's what 100% I meant. truth. Yeah, that's what I meant. But you, you might, yourself might have worked out 50% or 10% or whatever. Okay, good. So what, what I would want to find out is how would I therefore ground myself, just rationally, ground the Guru in some truth. For example, I want to go to the Guru now and, and have him as a pathway to the Divine yeah. to remove my ego. By the way, everything you said is very similar to the concept of the Fitra in the Islamic tradition. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that we already have knowledge of God, we already have an aspect that we want to worship God, and we basically cloud the natural disposition. That's what I was to say earlier, that yeah. the truth isn't limited to one religion, it's in all religions. So the point you find to... similar things in Buddhism, you find Yeah, similar exactly, from, Buddhism, from an ethical point of view, I 100% agree. But I'm just wondering about, for someone who to be attached to a guru, yeah. I would require some kind of what you call rational evidence, intellectual evidence, loosely. So I, wanna, I would I like to ask, what do we have in his life that shows to us the truth of his life? That would be my question. Yeah, I mean, like a historical person, I could make up a historical person X, hypothetically, and X, the unknown, right, lived a thousand years ago, and there are all these amazing narratives about this person. Yeah. Is that enough for me to follow X? Well, I would want to know a few things. Number one, are those narratives true, and how do we know that they're true? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course, of course. Well, with the Guru, what you've got is um, not just their lives, but also their own personal writings. Okay. Yeah. So the Guru is written Japji Sahib, Gurbani Ba'ai Ba'ai, the first Guru wrote, the very first prayer that every Sikh in the morning. It's his own words. So they wrote it, they were very written. Heard it in morning voice. Um, so when you read their writings, then uh, the writings have an impact upon you. So for example, um, how I got into Sikh, well, I would say is to two or three things. 
first one was too many patients on God's name. When I started experiencing God, it changed my life. Right? I experienced the divine, I felt the bliss, the love, all that kind of stuff, and I just felt like, wow, this is amazing. The second thing is when I started reading what the gurus taught, what they, what they, their philosophy, I was like, wow, this is amazing philosophy, this can change the world, this is, this is the truth. It appeals to me so much. Then the other thing is, um, is that when I was sitting in what they recommended as the highest place on earth, which is in the holy congregation, singing the words of the Guru. Because remember the Guru didn't just write philosophy, he wrote poetry. Yes. He wrote poetry that can be sung and he put it to music. He said, use this music, sing it this way and you will feel good. So when I felt that, it just transported me to the world. And then there's the other side, they experienced the Guru themselves. But the Guru isn't gone for us, he's not a dead person. There's all these souls that come here, and we believe in reincarnation, we believe that souls live on. So the Guru isn't gone, the Guru is still here. You can experience the Guru. So the grace of the Guru, the love of the Guru, the love of, with the Guru can happen to a Sikh. So I would say that Sikhism uh, has a lot of rationality around it, but the core essence of a Sikh is not based on uh, a rational uh, acceptance of the Guru, but it's based on the love of the Guru. And the Guru actually puts that in his own words. He said, listen everybody, I speak the truth. Only those who love will find God. So the Guru becomes a person who fall in love with. I, yeah? no, I don't, I don't, we've got a lot of history, obviously. I am the, religion, the religion is not that old. Yeah, you can say a thousand years ago, it's only 300 years ago. And within that 300 years, we've got all this philosophy, uh, teachings, the actual places they live, what they said, what they did, their own writings. So with the Gurus, uh, historically, we're quite blessed in that sense. So we know they were around. They weren't just somebody made it up. We know what they wrote. We know what they did. We've got people, families and generations that are still now linked to the Gurus in East who are around. So uh, historically, we're, we're blessed. Uh, and then obviously, uh, you know, spiritually, we're very blessed. So it seems to me that the answer to my question that I needed some kind of rational grounding still is well, still there. contingent on an, All emotional, the there. in an emotional, spiritual thing, Well, right? no, no, I don't think that's fair. But you said that it's love. Is that love? Trusting him because it's through love, and understanding his teachings, internalizing his teachings. I'm not dismissing it. I find yeah. that very profound. Don't get me wrong. But I think for it to be slightly more holistic, and it's the, one of the reasons why I became Muslim is because not only do you have what you call the nafsiyah, the internal psychological disposition, the spirituality, the ethics, the rules and stuff like that, the experiences, but you also have it grounded in a rational tradition. Okay. And I find that powerful. I think the thing here is... is Does that, that make sense to you? Yeah, I'll, I'll just explain. I've watched nearly all your videos for the rational arguments for God and found them lacking. Yeah, sure. That's my personal view. I'm not going to be offensive to you, but just give me your mind. So I've watched it. And the thing is, is, is I think that you've got some standard inside you to trying to say it's got to be rational. But that rational standard doesn't really doesn't stand up. Your own arguments don't stand up. So here's here's my view. Um, Why do you think that's the case? Because I, well, I watched your videos and they didn't really make me believe yeah, in God. No, no, I, if I was an atheist, I wouldn't believe no, in God based on those arguments. Absolutely. So so I don't think that you you can argue that you've got a rational viewpoint that can make I totally appreciate viewpoint. what you're saying. Because a lot of people watch your videos and don't believe the comments. Yeah, no, of course, of course, so when you say rational. It seems to imply can I, can transferability to everybody. Okay. That it must be yeah. something so rational no, that no, no, most rational people would agree with it. Okay, but I don't think that's let, true. let me give you the premise here. Right? We believe in the fitter and the natural disposition that we know God exists and He deserves to be worshipped. This, this, no, this is the natural disposition, right? No we have this. Okay. We, we, we have sorry, we have this innate nature, yeah. This natural disposition that we appreciate the oneness of God. We appreciate that. God deserves to be worshipped, right? Yeah. And this is the fitra, it's called the innate disposition. Imagine it like a like a glass. Well, we talked about this earlier. Yeah, that's but, not a new point. Yeah, but I want to bring it to this point. Okay. And what we say is if this glass is clouded or dirty, it requires cleaning. Yeah, yeah. Cleaning Agreed. can include rational arguments, can include the Quran, Agreed. the Sunnah, spiritual teachings, right. ethics, experiences, right? So it cleans the fitra. What's new in there for yeah, what I've got? Exactly. About. No, what's new is You've assumed that I'm using the argument as an end, not a means. Arguments are a means just to clean the fitna. Right. And why I want to take up a point. I totally appreciate you have an opinion on what old debates or whatever rubbish I used to talk about, right? But the point is, it is a claim. My question was, why aren't they coherent enough for you? That was my view, that was my point. But that's yeah. going to go to another topic which that, is irrelevant. That's, that's kind of like but you're judging me now on my rationality and logic. No, 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 I'm not. I'm saying you said that they weren't rational enough. And I was asking I'm just saying why. about your standard, because what you said to me now is very yeah. similar to what I would say to any, any Sikh. Say, if you want to get into Sikhi, 
and you, you like what the Gurus are teaching, yeah. then go into the Gurdwara, listen to explanations of the scripture, uh, sit in the Holy Congregation, chant God's name. What will that will do is slowly, slowly wash your uh, soul, what you were talking about earlier, and allow that light inside to come out and you can experience God. And when that experience happens, then you'll have real faith because it'll be based upon the experience of God. Before that, you've still got doubt because you're not quite sure. When that experience happens to you, that's it. You know, it's happening to you right now. It ties in with what every single uh, of the 36 people that wrote in Guru Granth Sahib Ji have also said. Mm -hmm. So it ties in, it's not just the Gurus, but it's the people that weren't even the Gurus, like Ram, uh, Kabir Ji and Ram yeah. These people, it ties in with them. Yeah. So then it gives you a sort of external sure. uh, confirmation that it's not just the Gurus, it's everybody else who's also, some people are before the Gurus, like Sheikh Farid is before the Gurus, other people are after the Gurus, uh, not after the Gurus, but obviously they're, they're the Gurus time. Yeah. But, yeah. And it can also tie in with the people that have since then lived as Sikhs, uh, earned the Sikh teaching and experience the same divine. So it becomes, and it, and it ties in with mystics across the world. Yeah, sure. So, you know, the mystical tradition is not just a Sikh tradition. It's in the Sufis, like we had our brothers here earlier, the Sufi brothers. Um, it's in the Sufis, it's in the Christians, it's all over the world. So what we're talking about is that looking at the world as a whole, it gives you that, you know what, I'm not just having a crazy experience that, can't, that no one else has had before. This is an experience that has happened to loads of people of different traditions and they all walk the same path, which to me is very rational to accept that as an, as a, as an argument for this, that you're not having a crazy experience well, no, and the we, Guru is giving you a really, great I, I would disagree with that here, why? Because if we just solely rely on the spiritual aspect, when we solely rely on the spiritual God. aspect. That is God. Yeah, but you can't just say don't, just don't rely upon God to believe in God. Yeah, no, no, believe in something else. As no, well. but the point is, God is God is God. God is. But you already have a standard of God, and you're trying to figure experience. No, I don't have a standard of God. I've got experience of God. I'm not talking about standard of God. I'm just saying experience. Are so you God. saying it's God? Then you yeah. have an experience, and it reaffirms God. So you're starting with. So you the have idea the Guru's teaching, yeah. taught by the Guru, yeah. and then you put them into practice. He's like a, he's like an instructor, yeah. right? The word Guru actually is based on the idea of an instructor. So he's got people that are sure you mentioned that before. So, so it doesn't really make much sense to say to me, I don't think it's fair that you believe in your gym teacher because now after his teachings you've become fit and strong and, you've, and now you've got faith in him. That's not fair. You looked at him first, you saw that he was fit. That's by his shoe, he was trying his way and now you're trying it and you become fit and strong and now you've got faith in That means that you decided what was fit first. Have you, have yeah, you you're right in a way. Have I you decided. studied philosophy? You do know that. I, I, I do. Oh, you have. Yeah, yeah, do. Okay, good. So, uh, I did this for a postgrad, right? And then what you would understand is that just because something works, it doesn't mean it's true. Yeah, right? agree. So you have to appreciate that. No, I agree. So your whole premise. And then I gave you the other idea about the about the, yeah, the no, confirmation of all the other different faiths and understand that what you're going through is not just a Sikh thing. It's just mystics across the world. Yeah, that's through. fine. That's if you believe that's grounded in some kind of rational truth. The point is, you have to understand that just because something works, it doesn't mean it's true. Like in the scientific method, for example, they had this theory called phlogiston. Phlogiston, it was in the 1700s. Now phlogiston was very interesting because they said that any combustible object that burnt, it would release phlogisticated air. Now that was a workable theory in the 1700s that chemists used and Dan Rutherford in 1772 or 1773, he basically used that theory to discover nitrogen, discovered the truth. But then they find out later that that theory of phlogiston was false. Yeah. So this one example of many, like in the philosophy of science, just because something works, it doesn't mean it's true. Likewise, in spirituality, just because something works, it doesn't mean it's true. And that's why I, I want you to find out what Sikhism is about, because everything you've said really, for me, and I, please correct me if I'm wrong, can be reduced to just an experiential thing, which is fine, it's very needed, don't get me wrong. Okay. Islam is can very I important. The point I've understood the point, I don't need any more explanation. Okay. So, Actually, let me talk as well though, yeah? No, 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 you spoke for quite a while, I think yeah. you spoke for quite a while. But here, here's the point, right? You get that point, what I'm when, saying? When you speak, yeah, I do understand, I'll explain to you how I yeah. understand that it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in, when I was studying philosophy at university, one of the things we talked about was actually this idea of experiential. And do we know, how do we know Something what is true? Yeah. So one of the arguments we make is, well, the colour purple, uh, right, is a, is a subjective thing. It's not necessarily objective, right? Yeah. So one of the problems with... The experience with, of purple. The co yeah. experience of colour, uh, experience of anything. Absolutely. Most things are purely uh, uh, subjective. You can't objectify them. So how they decide to go beyond this kind of Descartes philosophy where you're not Descartes but kind of like you're living in your own slipsism, I think. Yes, yeah, but then they just live in their own world and nothing else makes sense. Is they then Descartes try to get to it through God. Yeah? We try to get through it just by trying to think of it like logic, yeah? Like even if I spend all day thinking I can't prove that's purple, 
when I go home, I say to my wife, she likes this purple cock. She knows it's purple, I know it's purple. Everybody around me knows it's purple. If I spend my whole day working out, can I know it's purple or not? Maybe it's a different purple. I'm going to be basically wasting my time because it's kind of idiocy. Right? Like I said earlier, it's like if you assume that people are idiots, then yeah, they can't do that. But people aren't idiots. Yeah? Because God hasn't made us to be idiots, because God's you know, the creator. So, taking that argument, when color is subjective, in the same way you might say, well actually, color may be subjective, but really, it's quite objective, because most of you would have to agree upon it. So you can generalize, otherwise you couldn't really live or survive. Yeah, right? for something that's So, in the same way, when I said to you earlier, when you have that experience of God, okay, it's, a, it's the same as the A is purple. backed up by what the Guru is saying, yeah. B is backed up by all the other people inside the Guru Granth Sahib that are not even sick, from the sick background. But why is what the Guru is saying is true? That was my question no, from no, the beginning. It's, it's, the point of it being true is that it works. Yeah, but now, what works doesn't mean it's but, true. No, but the fact that it works and it's worked consistently for different people, a different faith, different backgrounds, and the Gurus, and that they say that Just it's Just like Flogiston, bro, it no. worked and it came out to be false. No, 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 no. The point here is, is that... Newton's laws work, but okay. they're not absolutely true. But here's the thing. Until someone can... But you see my point? And so, until someone can disprove that the experience I'm having, or what the Gurus are saying, is not true, right? I'm entitled to believe that Okay, there's two ways to just move right? your experience Firstly. hypothetically. Number one, with another experience, or number, and that just becomes subjective. Or number yeah. two, by some external criteria, like reason or rationality. Yeah, but that external point. criteria that you gave earlier about why you think rationally, Islam is true. I didn't give any criteria. Really I didn't give any no, criteria. but you've done it online too many times in arguments. Yeah, but let's be fair, bro. And to be honest, not really let's be fair. Let's be fair. Okay, fair enough. Let's, no, let's be fair. And stuff, but Let me just take something. Right? This, this, this is Nasiha advice to you, right? Never in a conversation with someone refer to the old work, especially when you're not even even saying what is wrong about it. That's a bit unfair. No. And I would say not not part of the ethics of discussion. I could say to you, bro, I saw a video of you. You talked about Abdurrahim Green two years ago in a video, and you know what? You're slightly incoherent here. I, it's, I think it's it's bad. That's a fair point to make, as you say. It. Yeah, but you haven't even said you what was wrong it. with it. That's my yeah. point. You just keep on saying it's wrong. But you're not saying why it's wrong. Yeah, but it, it didn't. What I, I did say to you why it was why I thought it was wrong because it didn't. As a rational person, convince me that there is a problem. No, but that's not the statement. That's a claim. You need to tell me why that. Like, why is that claim? No, but surely, when you're saying, you see what I'm trying to say here? You're pointing to an idea that someone who is rational listens to you and then goes, "Yeah, it's true." I'll give you an example. Yeah. Um, I do a physics experiment. You know, I throw a ball off a cliff. It falls down. I have a camera that measures its uh, speed, and I say to people, well, "I use this camera to measure the speed." and the ball fell at this speed. Every rational person would buy that. Mm. Only an irrational person would say no. So the arguments you presented, I don't have to go to specifics of each one. What I can say is rationally, they haven't worked. And the, and the proof of that is not just me, is that many people have watched your work who are rational people and not bought it. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, 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 hey, I'm going to hold on to you. But, 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 but let me I'll give you the opposite. Still not let me give you the why. opposite. Many people, but many people have become Muslim. Let me finish. Many people have found them rational. True, true. But the other thing is, so how is many what people have. How, how but is your here's, claim here's my argument. Has many validated? people have understood this rationality argument I'm talking about, that the experience is not just subjective. By taking the idea of color, you can take the objectivity, apply it across the board, and look at other people of different faiths and backgrounds, and actually say, oh, you know what? This makes a lot of sense. It's actually the truth. And it's not just purely. But listen, bro, here the point is, I haven't met a single person who's experienced the divine in the way that we just talked about. I met a guy earlier who was a... I don't know what he was. Well, you've met me. Oh, I know you. But, but, but I don't know if you've had that experience. Seat. Seat. We haven't talked about that experience and what you've experienced. Yeah, but this guy talked about his experiences of God and I talked about There's my experiences. There's millions of people. The point is, when he, he was agreeing with everything I'm talking about because the rationality made sense to him. Oh, yeah. But the rationality comes from that lens of that spirituality. Sure. Any rationality I'm not denying that. I'm, for me, I'm, I'm, it's I'm not really worth I'm with you 100% on the spirituality issue, right? I, uh, when I'm trying to deconstruct... Like the Sufi brothers. Yeah. Absolutely. They're, they're spiritual. Absolutely. They, bought, they agreed with us. Absolutely. Right? So, well, I, don't, I don't disagree with you about the innate nature and about spirituality and ethics and connecting with the divine. I'm with you here, right? Yeah. My only issue is, is the how you connect with the divine according to your tradition. Because you said you can't equate the experience of purple and knowing it's purple with a tradition that requires a whole set of teachings and experiences to understand its truth. Because purple you understand without so any of those... I'm losing you because I, I, okay. I don't know if you're going too philosophical, but uh, okay. it's hard to okay. understand what is you're this saying. blue? Yes. This is yellow? Yes. Good. This is the beautiful beard, right? Mashallah. So you got beautiful beard. So we know it's a beard, it's blue and it's yellow. Yeah. I don't need a set of 
intermediary experiences to understand that. Yeah. I don't need a whole philosophy, a theology to understand that, yeah. right? So it's, it's you're falsely equating two things here. You no, can't what, equate. What let me let me explain, man. Okay, you can't equate the yeah, feeling of purple, the understanding that those are white trainers, yeah. with the fact that the Buddhist teachings are absolutely true. Because you've been told, you've been just said before, you need a bunch of experiences, you need the Buddha's teachings. So for me, you can't equate those two things okay, as the I same. Does that honest. make sense? Okay. I said to you earlier. I'm just, just, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just saying right. a lot of things that you're saying are, are, right. are nice, they're fluffy, but they're, fluffy, say, but they're very incoherent. Okay. No, they're not. I'll explain to you. Yeah, sure. You could be sitting in a dark room and you don't know about colors. Yes. Right? Because, like I said to you earlier, God is not something that. It's like the Frank Jackson experiment. I don't know who, who oh, that sorry. guy is, but I'm making this up on the spot, right? So, so you just, said you studied philosophy. Yeah, so. but I don't know who that guy is. Okay, cool. Do you understand that? Yeah. Okay, so let's get back to the point. So we're sitting in a dark room because, like Plato was talking about, the people in the cave, they don't Absolutely. know the truth, right? So most people are unaware of God. Most people are, are totally separate from God in yes. that sense. Yes. So a person separate from God is very similar to someone sitting in a dark room. Okay. Right? Yes. Now, when they're in this dark room, we're trying to explain to them color. Yeah. They're like, so black in here. They have to experience color. Yeah. So the person says, you can give me all this philosophy, mate. But I'm not going to believe in it until I see colour, right? That doesn't mean that person is wrong for having trusted you that there is colour because you've just come in from outside and told them all about it. They might have a doubt in your mind, in their mind, that oh, is there colour or not? Is this guy just pulling it? You know, on me, it's always been dark or I've been there. But they say, Do you know what? I'll give you, a, I'll give you a proof. Why don't you hold my hand, come with me through that door, and I'll take you into colour, and you see colour. Now, it would not be fair to say that person is irrational to choose to follow that person. Agreed. It would be irrational. It would be a rational thing to say, you know what, why not try it? If that person, you know known them for a long time, they looked after you, they took care of you, they were very trustworthy, you would say, let's go for it, let's try it. And then you go outside and voila, and you see colour. And not only do you see colour, you see a whole bunch of other people walking around who also see colour. Sure. And they all agree that that is purple, and that is a, a yellow uh, jumper, and that's a blue hoodie, and that's a nice green. Yes. They all agree with you. So suddenly you think, hallelujah, it must be true. And that would not be an irrational person. No, I agree. Well, there you go. But that's a solely experience. And what we're talking about in the no, beginning, bro. Well, no, but you just said something else. What? You have to remind me what you said. You said you've experienced any of the Guru's teachings. So coming back to my original question that you tried to answer was, yeah. how do you rationally ground the Guru's teachings? I just said to you, like, no, no. could you separate Guru's teachings You know, you've got that weird argument, the 40 uh, no, 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 no. Are we doing some circular kind of thing going on here as no, well? No, no, it feels no. like we're just going round, round. Allow the ad hominems there. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not cussing Honestly. you. Allow the cusses, right? Uh, let's, let's keep the other. No, but you're known to be a nice guy. I, I'm trying to be nice. And a bad guy like me, I I'm don't want to shame you. I, I'm, 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 I'm supposed to be the I'm bad not, guy, I'm right? I'm not a nice guy. But, but you are a nice guy. No, I'm trying. One I'm trying to be a nice guy. I'm trying to listen to you. Did you? But I'll just yeah. explain something I thought made sense to most people. No, but no, you just no, gone I, back no, and said it doesn't make sense. I just said it makes sense. No, it makes sense. But I'm trying to see how it makes sense within everything that you've said. So what you're saying is, do you agree that guy was rational? In the dark room. to a degree, but right. if the, if so I'm, I'm the guy okay, in the dark room. He, I'm the guy in the dark okay, room. Okay, but if that guy right? told you, therefore, uh, there is no gravity after that, you're not going to trust him, right? True, but the good exactly. doesn't say anything li lies to him. But that's my point. My point is, for someone who doesn't accept a song, right, yeah. is someone he may know what colors look like, but it's like taking the guy at the dark room saying that's purple, and then the guy's trusting him because saying it's purple, but then it's saying, look, look at the horizon. The Earth is flat. So just because I'm just trusting... Just because someone doesn't believe in Islam, then you're saying they're equivalent to somebody who uh, could get told a lie later on, but they're not sure, they could never work out no, no, it was no, true. Sorry, you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. What I'm trying to say is, you could trust someone, but if you're in a dark room all your life, and they've taken you out and said, look at colour, and this is the colour purple, and it's you work. could trust them. But, but it, you can't just trust that one can person. You it's, yeah, that, it's, that, fine. it's that what I talked about earlier, the rational reality that it's not just yes, one person. Yes, but then can you trust him if he tells you something that is irrational? That's my point. Um, it's a good question. The question, and that's what I've been trying to okay. get at all along. Because right. so, you, you, you distinguish between the experiences so, let, let, and the Guru's teachings. Let me go into something. You remember else. that 70-30% okay. thing right. that you mentioned about? Okay. And I've asked, can you ground the Guru's teachings as evidence? And you can't rely on experiences because you've disconnected them. So therefore, what is the evidence for the Guru's teachings? And you've spent okay. quite a long time not doing that. Just I'll keep just, on talking about experiences, which is a secular argument. Let, let's say, for example, somebody comes into Sikhism who's not from a Sikh background or an Indian background yeah. so they're white yeah? they come in they meditate uh, they start experience God right and uh, they believe in the Guru's experience about God they buy that they're cool but then they've never heard about reincarnation 
and they've got this philosophy they think I don't know if I can give this philosophy you know because yeah, I have no proof of this and whatever right so fair enough now the Guru says that Sikhi is about enlightenment so it's not just one door when you open and you see colour there's a whole bunch of other things that are going to happen afterwards as you go through more and more doors of enlightenment a bit like and how do you know that's true though? well let me just explain as you, as you go through the cave analogy right you're coming out and out and you're expanding your horizon and your doors of perception yeah right? So, initially, you might say, well, I don't I'm not sure if reincarnation is true or not. However, based on what the Guru has told me so far, right, and I haven't experienced it, but I believe what he said so far, and I believe in the morals of the Guru so far, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to reserve judgment on whether it's true or not, I'm going to trust the Guru, but the Guru does say it's possible for you to keep growing spiritually to the point where you can experience your previous life. When you have that experience of your previous life, voila, now, you not only listened to it, followed it, but you've actually now accepted it to be true because you've seen it to be true. Little experiences, basically. Right, because but the whole of Sikhi is about spirituality. Sure. And expi because at one point, the soul goes from a somebody who's in a dark room okay, good. to being somebody being totally one with God. I've got it, I've got it. Totally one with God. It's a very so it's all, conversation. It's all about growth. So this is where maybe the subtle difference between Sikhism and Islam comes into play, right? Sure, go ahead. Where Islam, from that point of view, has the whole concept of the fifth of the innate disposition, ibadah, worship, which means to love God, to know God, to obey God, and to single all acts of worship to Him alone. We have this kind of profound kind of theo philosophy, if you like, with this idea, concept, reality of the oneness of God, affirming His oneness, Tawheed, yeah, we've got uh, that well. in His names and attributes, in His singularity. You better give me some differences. So far, hey, yeah, singularities. No, no. Yeah, I'm connecting with okay, you, man. So, right. I think the differences here is that regard, like, no matter where you go with your experiences, there's always going to be this very base grounding. Call it rationality, call it innate truth. Where is that? Where are you? Are you, are you yeah. I mean, uh, I know you're I'm waiting for me to say, go, go and give me the rationality. No, no, I'm not, I, don't, I don't want to say that. No. Uh, what I'm saying is, is that we would say Tawheed, the conceptualization of the divine, yeah. as per the Islamic tradition, is that foundation. So your experiences are seen through them. Because, for example, if someone came up to me, a Christian, he said, I had a dream of Jesus, right? Yeah. And a Jew could come up to me and say, I had a dream of Moses. Yeah. And a Buddhist said, I had a dream of Buddha. Yeah. Now, as a human being, I'm not going to deny his experiences. Yeah, of I mean, that's evil, yeah, right? Because you deny them. You yeah, deny yeah. your relationship yeah, now, right? Yeah. What I do, though, and I try to do it in the most compassionate way, I say, look, the way to really understand your experiences is to understand the filter, the lenses that you use to see your experiences, right? So what I do then, I go to those filters and lenses. And that's very critical because many people have different experiences, but they have different truths. Yeah. And that's fundamental, okay. right? So how do so, you reconcile that then, you yourself? So, so you've got I a guy say, who's saying, I've met, I had Buddha, another guy saying, I had give me the keys and then Moses. How do you as an individual, I, I want to teach what do you say, yeah. that actually in your heart, I'll ask a simple question, yeah. in your heart do you think that the dream was purely in their mind but there's no other link to it? It's not no, 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 we believe that, you know, there, there are, there are, do you believe Buddha is around? There are three types of dreams, there are three types of dreams for example. One type of dream is from the divine, one is based on uh, musings and thoughts and one is from basically the kind of negative realm, the satanic reality right? Yes, on. So from that point of view, we do appreciate that dreams have a basis, but what I'm saying here is how do you get them to see the experiences via the lenses of truth? And well, that's, what and is that's it? Well, you've already decided well, what well, lens yeah, of truth is. Yeah, so no, you know, exactly. But then that's I've a, got a lens of truth as well for me, the Guru. So I would, I'm no, but asking the, you now, no, how would you see point. it? Let me finish but my point. Simple question. Tell me how you see it. Let me finish my point and answer your question. My point here is, since you understand that you have experiences and you can filter them from different lenses, yeah. what you've solely given to me at the moment is just experiences. Okay. Right? You haven't shown to me why your filters or lenses are true. And that's my point. Because I could talk about any form of spirituality and make it coherent because it's within that paradigm. What I'm saying to you, let's step out of the paradigm, right? Let's step out of the paradigm. We have certain lenses that you're viewing your narratives, your spiritual discourse, whatever you want to call it. And I'm saying what Islam does for me, and obviously we probably can't discuss this today, it takes a long time, that it gives me those filters. That's my point. Also, the right filter.